Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, today, we are revisiting our Stay in Care series um, with a Stay in Care with CHD, Living with Congenital Valve Disease. Um, before we begin, I just want to give a couple of housekeeping notes. All attendees are in listen-only mode. If you cannot hear, hopefully you can see the slides and read them. Check the audio button on your personal computer to be assured the sound is on. That's typically the issue. Please type your questions in the Q&A box at any time during the presentation because we will be reading questions aloud um, after the presentation is over. So you don't have to wait. You can just put them in and they'll be there for us. Uh, please note that Dr. Lynn is not able to answer any questions about your child or you as a, as a patient specifically because he's not your treating physician. Uh, and finally, the PDF version of the slides, as well as a recording of this presentation, will be available on the Mended Little Hearts website following the event. Mended Hearts, Inc. mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life of heart patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and advocacy. Mended Little Hearts' program serves the littlest heart patients of all those who have congenital heart defects or CHD and their families. I am Andrea Baer, the executive director here at Mended Hearts. And I am joined today by Jody Smith, the national program director. So now I'd like to introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Huey Lin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Huey Lin is the director of, of the Accredited Adult Congenital Heart Comprehensive Care Program at Houston Medith Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. He trained at Barnes Jewish and St. Louis Children's Hospital at Washington University in PCI, Structural and Congenital Interventional Cardiology. His research interests are in the import of advanced cardiovascular imaging to the cath lab for complex congenital interventions. More recently, he has been awarded funding from PCORI to build an adult congenital heart patient stakeholder roundtable of underrepresented minorities to engage in comparative and effectiveness research as equal partners. Dr. Lin, thank you for joining us. And I am going to let you take it from here. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It's really, really a fantastic pleasure. Um, to be able to um, talk to all of you today about one of my favorite subjects, which is congenital heart valve disease. Um, and so thank you for the introduction. Um, so just so that we're all on the same page, um, these are my disclosures, um, not too many and not too bad, um, uh, but I do re or receive some uh, research support from Siemens Health and Nears. Um, so the reason why we have so much to talk about now is that, as all of you probably know now, there was a really huge revolution in cardiac surgery in the 20th century, and that's really what sort of brought us to today. So uh, many of you know that one of the major groundbreaking work was the Blalock Tausi Thomas shunt that started in 1944, which really allowed for tetralogy flow patients to survive um, early childhood for the first time in history. But the next major breakthrough was the advent of cardiopulmonary bypass or the heart lung machine, which allowed surgeons to operate on the heart safely for the first time in history. And then with that revolution, it was not surprising that many other lesions could successfully be fully repaired thereafter, including finally in the 1980s, the cracking of the code of the single ventricle, where the Fontan became standard of care in terms of the treatment of the single ventricles. And now we see for the very first time in history, a whole host of adults with congenital heart disease. And that is what's made my field possible. And so when we think about things, we think about it not only as a tremendous success, but it also is something that we have to think about how to prepare for. So at this point, there are um, a child that's born with congenital heart disease today has more than 90% uh, likelihood of surviving to adulthood. And so when we think about this, we think about this as a good problem, but also a bad problem in the sense that this is a tidal wave of adults with congenital heart disease that we're going to be facing. In fact, in 2020, there was an estimate that there were going to be nearly 2 million adults with congenital heart disease in the United States alone. And so that's why we think it's so important that we talk about why it's important to stay in care and what that looks like. So in order to get us there and start thinking about what that actually means specifically, let's start off with a specific case. 
And this is actually a more common case than we like to admit. So this was a case that was told to us as completely impossible. This was a 27 year old woman with tetralogy full from South Carolina. Um, and she has actually given us permission to talk about her case um, so that we can spread the importance of staying in care. So she was initially turned down for valve replacement at two other centers who felt that she was too risk in part because she was Jehovah's Witness and did not want to take blood products. And it was felt that in order for her to go through a valve replacement successfully that she would require blood transfusion because she'd already had initial tetralogy full open heart surgery. So we were challenged with coming up with an idea of how to replace the valve in the setting of a patient who had a right ventricular outflow tract that was too large. So what, this was early on in the experience of transcatheter valve technology. And so we had to come up with a new solution. So one of the major challenges was she lived in South Carolina. We are here in Houston and we didn't have a way of getting her here without having a large amount of expense to her personally so that we could try to figure out whether or not we could actually treat her. And so what we did instead was we had her get a CT scan locally in South Carolina send us that cardiac CT, and then we made a 3D print of her heart. And then we started coming up with ways in which we could treat her. And so using the 3D printed heart, we were actually able to look at her heart almost as though it was sitting in front of us. And we came up with the following solution. We had to minimize blood loss because she's Jehovah's Witness and would not take blood products. We had to restore the competency of the pulmonary valve because she had wide open pulmonic regurgitation or leaking of the pulmonic valve. And we had to optimize safety. So to get to that point, we came up with the following solution. So our surgeon decided that he could safely open the chest if his main focus was on minimizing blood loss. We decided that if the surgeon could minimize blood loss and to put a band around the pulmonary artery, that would create a landing zone for us to place a transcatheter valve through a direct puncture in the right ventricle. And that's what you see here. What you see is a transcatheter valve being deployed from within her heart through a puncture directly in her right ventricle because the surgeon has opened the chest for us and created a perfect landing zone for us to deploy this transcatheter valve. And then here, what you see is our final angiography after we've implanted that valve. And now she has a perfectly competent pulmonary valve that's been implanted through that direct puncture. So the benefit of this, of, of course, is that we never needed to put her on cardiopulmonary bypass or the heart-lung machine. And the surgeon could focus his entire surgical aspect on getting perfect minimal blood loss. Um, so he could ensure that the chest stayed completely dry. We never had to put her on the heart-lung machine and we could do everything through small punctures in the right ventricle once he had placed the band around the pulmonary artery. And in this situation, we actually had a technology that allowed us to assess what exactly her blood loss was. And that was 28 cc's. She had no change in her hemoglobin after the surgery. And she was actually discharged on post-operative day three because she was never placed on cardiopulmonary bypass. And she did fantastic. So we took a high five afterwards about a week later. Um, and this is her with the rest of our team, um, including her holding her 3D printed heart. Um, and this is fantastic. But the real question that I think we have to step back is why did this happen and what can we learn from this, um, even though this is a really wonderful case of success. And the answer for this is it turns out that more than 90% of tetralogy flow patients will require a pulmonary valve replacement. And unfortunately, that is inherent to the initial tetralogy flow quote unquote repair. And that ultimately is why staying in care is so critical. And we're going to talk about that in a lot more detail because it affects not just tetralogy flow patients, but many of our other adults with congenital heart disease and children with congenital heart disease that have valve lesions. So let's talk about tetralogy flow repair for those of you who have uh, loved ones with tetralogy flow and why this is so important. So starting off, this is the problem with tetralogy flow. So fundamentally in blue, you see that the right ventricle has these obstructions as demarcated by the one arrows. And these obstructions are due to muscle bundles that grow at the right ventricle outflow tract. As well, you see the VSD, the hole between the right and left ventricles pointed out by the arrow marked VSD. 
But one of the major problems is that the surgeon has to not only remove those muscle bundles that obstruct the right ventral alpha tract, but they also have to make the pulmonic valve there bigger. So you see there's a blue valve there that's smaller than the red valve, which is the aortic valve. In order to make it bigger, the surgeon has to make an incision as you see marked in red, and then you have to make it as large as possible, which is placing a patch across it to enlarge that orifice. So what this does is it allows blood flow through the pulmonary valve that wasn't going through there before because it was obstructed. But you can imagine there's going to be a problem if you slice through the annulus, the ring of the pulmonic valve and end up cutting through the valve itself and putting a patch across it. You can also see, of course, that the VSD has been patch closed there. So there's no longer a hole communicating between the right ventricle and left ventricle. But the problem is if you slice through the pulmonic valve and you place a patch across it, you're going to have a problem ultimately. And what that means is that these patients are ultimately going to need a valve replacement because they are left with a widely leaking pulmonic valve from their initial tetralogy of full repair. So as I mentioned, more than 90% of tetralogy flow patients are going to require this valve replacement. There are a select few that will come out of the surgery with a competent pulmonary valve. So not everyone, but most. So these are the goals of today's talk. We want to emphasize that staying in care is vitally important for our congenital heart disease patients, especially when it relates to valvular heart care. And we'll talk about some details to that and why it becomes so important. We're gonna talk about how to safely get care for congenital valvular heart disease in today's environment. And there are many different components that are important to that discussion. And then finally, we're gonna talk about some innovations in valvular heart care and, and what you can look forward to and why I often tell people that this is a great time to be a patient with congenital heart disease because we have some of the greatest resources and innovations in congenital heart disease than we've ever had in the history of medicine. So. Let's start with talking about why staying in care is so vitally important. So first off, let's set the stage for what we're talking about. Let's talk about how the heart works and why the valves are important. So to start with, let's talk about the four chambers of the heart. So here you can see I've outlined in blue the right atrium and the right ventricle, and in red or pink, the left atrium and the left ventricle, and then I've outlined the different valves. So the way the heart functions is, and the body functions is the following. Initially, you get the blue deoxygenated blood flow returning through the veins via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava into the right atrium, okay? The right atrium then fills the right ventricle via the tricuspid valve. The right ventricle then pumps that deoxygenated blue blood into the lungs via the pulmonary artery after going through the pulmonic valve. Likewise, once the blood flow goes through the lungs, it comes back oxygenated, and here I've shown it pink, coming back to the left atrium, which the blood flow then goes to the mitral valve in, to fill the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle pumps that pink oxygenated blood through the aortic valve to the body, through the aorta. And then, of course, once the blood flow goes through the body, it deoxygenates the blood, and the process starts all over again. And of course, the whole reason for having valves in the first place is so that the blood flow goes in one direction. You don't want the blood flow going backwards. If the blood flow goes backwards, if there's regurgitation or blood flow going backwards, then that's going to overload the previous chamber. Likewise, if there's obstruction to any one of the valves, it's gonna cause the previous chamber to struggle to pump through that chamber. So that is how valves work, and that's why valves are important to the natural function of the body circulation and the heart. So how does this actually work when we're looking at it? So here's what we're looking at in terms of how the heart functions. So you can see here, again, the atria are on the top and the ventricles are on the bottom in the schematic. And what you can see here is in diastole, when the blood flow goes from the atria into the ventricles, what's happening is you're really preparing the ventricles to fill with blood so they can be full of blood in the next phase when they pump the blood outwards. And so during this time, it, when the ventricles are filling, the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve are closed. At the same time, in order for the ventricles to fill, the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve are open. Then, insistently, when the ventricles pump 
what you see then is that the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve close so that the blood flow doesn't go backwards in the atria when those ventricles pump. But at the same time, in order to enable the blood flow out of the ventricles into both the lungs and the body at the same time, the aortic valve opens and the pulmonic valve opens at that time. And so through these two aspects, diastole, which is the filling of the ventricles, and systole, which is the pumping of the ventricles, you can see why the valves are so important to prevent the blood flow from going backwards during those two different phases of the heart. So how do things go badly when you're looking at um, congenital heart disease and valve pathology? Well, so I like to break it down into three different types of mechanisms. The first one is born this way, right? So you can be born with a bicuspid or unicuspid or even quadricuspid aortic valve. And that's very common in many of our patients. Likewise, you can have a dysplastic valve like the tricuspid valve in Epstein's. And then a third example is the cleft mitral valve, like we see in AV septal defect and AV canal defect patients. And that can have varying different levels of valvular pathology, depending on the severity of how bad that disease is when the patient was born. Likewise, you can, be, um, you can have the development of acquired valvular disease. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that can happen in a little bit. Um, and in fact, if you live long enough most of us will potentially develop st um, aortic stenosis as we get older. So many of our 80 and 90 year olds will develop aortic sclerosis, which is hardening of the aortic leaflets, and then ultimately aortic stenosis as the valve leaflets can no longer open as we get older. So that's just natural history, what we call natural history, which is the evolution of our bodies as we get older. And then finally, and probably most commonly, in addition to being born with congenital heart valvular disease, is surgical valvular disease. And so here you can see examples of multiple different types of surgical valves, as well as the tetralogic flow repair that I showed you earlier. So on the far left, you see an autograft, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail in a minute, a homograft, which is a cadaveric valve taken from another human donor that has been preserved in say either glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde. So it is pretty much just a structural valve that's made out of human tissue, but the tissue is now dead. There are no living cells in it. And that is used to reconstruct a lot of the valve tissue um, and sometimes even the pulmonary artery and aortic uh, aorta in some of our patients. In the middle, you see bioprosthetic valves, which is typically a tissue valve constructed out of um, animal tissue, such as either cow tissue or pig tissue. Fourth in line, you see the mechanical uh, prosthesis, which here you can see two discs um, that form the functioning valve. And then finally, the childhood repair and tetralogy fallow. These are five different types of surgical treatments for valvular heart disease that ultimately leave um, potentially a problem with the valve. So, there are many different ways to fix a valve problem. So here you can see what aortic valve surgery looks like. And what we're looking at here is what's called primary aortic valve repair. What we're talking about specifically is where the surgeon goes in to fix the problem with the valve. So here you can see many different things happening with the valve, but in brief, what we're talking about here is that the surgeon is fixing leakage through the valve while at the same time ensuring that the valve doesn't further degenerate. And that's what we call primary repair. He's, uh, he or she is using suture and, uh, and felt pledgets to actually repair the valve and fix the valve so it is no longer either stenotic or regurgitant. That is not always feasible. And so what has to happen instead is a replacement. And so again, as we talked about, you can use a uh, cadaveric human tissue, you can use an animal tissue valve, or you can use a mechanical valve. And here also you can see a mitral valve. And here you can see a cleft mitral valve that has actually been suture repaired. And again, in this particular situation, if it turns out well, the patient can do okay with the repair alone, without a replacement. Now, the challenge with this is you can see I put fixed in quotation marks because unfortunately, oftentimes this is not permanent, okay? So 
You can imagine that if things break down in your car over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, you can only imagine what happens in a heart that's beating 60 to 80 to 100 beats a minute, what happens over the course of say 10, 15, 20 years with this valve that's opening and closing 60, 80, 100, 150 beats a minute over the course of a couple of decades. So you can imagine that that stuff will ultimately potentially degenerate and that's why it's so important that we have you stay in care. So let's talk about some details here. So here are all the different types of repairs that I could brainstorm up about the different valves. So we've talked about how there's an aortic valve and a pulmonary valve that's, um, that leads from the ventricles to the body and the lungs. And then the mitral valve and tricuspid valve that separates the atria from the ventricles. And you can see here that all of these are different types of repairs and replacements that can occur. And unfortunately, I can't really tell you that any of these are permanent and never need looking after again. So I would say all of them probably need some sort of evaluation during the lifetime of a patient after their initial repair, if not regular evaluation by a congenital heart specialist. So why is that the case? Well, if you think about the goals of congenital heart surgery in child, really the surgeon's goal is to get the child to reach to adulthood. I'm gonna say that again. The goal of the surgeon is to try to get the child to reach adulthood. And we talked about that a little bit with the tetralogy of fallow repair, that the goal is not to create perfection, not to quote unquote, fix the heart or cure the heart, but to get the child to reach an adult size for the reason that if you have to replace the valve, you can put in an adult sized valve when you need to do so. And so what that has led us to at this point is that some people in the congenital heart healthcare provider community now would prefer the phrase palliation as opposed to repair, because the reality is repair sounds a little bit too much like we're going to fix the problem permanently. And we think maybe it's a little bit misleading to say that it's being repaired since we know that most patients are going to have to come back to see us on a regular basis thereafter. So what we like to tell people then is that repair is not cure. And specifically here, I, I've shown you a homograft, which is that cadaveric valve replacement here, which includes not only the pulmonic valve, but also the right and left pulmonary arteries. And the key element to understanding this is that how the patient is repaired is important to understanding the future complications and the need for interventions without getting into too many details. But as you can see in Tetralogy of Fallot, those patients are going to need a valve replacement in their pulmonic position. And the challenge with this is if you replace the valve too early and you put a small valve in a child, the patient will just like their shoes and their clothes will potentially outgrow that valve when they get older. And so that's why surgeons try so hard in childhood not to replace the valve unless absolutely necessary. If they do replace the valve, bioprosthetic valves we know degenerate over time and fail. And unfortunately, one of the challenges in our younger patients is that the younger you are, the more likely that valve is potentially going to degenerate, such that sometimes we expect bioprosthetic valves to degenerate over the course of 10 years, and that that patient will need a valve replacement at the 10 year time frame. The other major problem that we are now seeing more and more of, and I think it's probably because we're better aware of it rather than it happening more frequently, is endocarditis. So endocarditis is the infection of the valve and its tissue in particularly more common in the setting of prosthetic material. It can happen in these types of human cadaveric valves. It can happen in mechanical valves and it can happen in bioprosthetic valves. It can even happen in native valves as well if there are certain predisposing lesions related to it. So that's why endocarditis is now becoming a very hot and important topic in congenital heart disease patients because we think it may be happening more frequently in our congenital heart disease patients probably in part because a lot of our congenital heart disease patients have prosthetic material in their hearts, if not frankly, a prosthetic valve in place. And then finally, 
as many of you know, a mechanical valve requires anticoagulation in order for those leaflets to continue functioning and not to have patients have malfunctioning of those mechanical leaflets, or frankly, in those patients who have a mechanical aortic valve or a mitral valve, having a stroke. And so warfarin um, is a critical element of that. And those of you who are on warfarin know that monitoring the INR continuously is a critical element to safety, well-being, as well as quality of life. So now that we've talked about why staying in care is so important, let's talk about how you can stay in care and continue safely getting care for congenital valve disease, even in the current environment. Well, so the first challenge is the following, okay? As I showed you at the very beginning, we in the adult congenital heart space consider adults with congenital heart disease almost like a tidal wave, which is a good problem to have because that means that our pediatric colleagues and pediatric cardiac surgical colleagues have been tremendously successful. The challenge though, is that we haven't in the adult world completely caught up to ensuring that the resources are available for congenital heart patients arriving in the adult space. And what that means then is that as a congenital heart patient, we need to make sure that you are getting into care at an adult congenital heart center. So there are now evolutions of the adult congenital heart center, including the ACHA's comprehensive care center designation, which is a designation that suggests that that center has the right resources to take care of congenital heart patients as they arrive into adulthood. That's not the only type of center that's out there that should take care of congenital heart disease as patients reach adulthood, but it is one of the designations that exists. The reason why I'm talking about that is because sometimes when we think about a patient who has a valvular heart disease and congenital heart disease, people get a little fixated on the valve problem and they forget about the rest of the CHD. And I'll talk about a specific example in that uh, in a moment. And so what, again, I wanna reemphasize is as you're tr transitioning to adult care, it is critical that you find a center that really can take care of adults with congenital heart disease. So that way you have full care as a congenital heart disease patient. So let's talk about a specific example. So this is a 45 year old man who underwent a Ross procedure. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. We'll talk about that in a second. This is the challenge that we face. And we wanna ensure that this doesn't happen to you or your loved one. So again, because in the Ross procedure, this patient was seen to have an aortic valve, aortic root problem, as well as a tricuspid valve problem, he was specifically referred for aortic re repair, valve replacement of the aortic valve and tricuspid repair only. It wasn't taken into account that he had already had a Ross procedure and that there could potentially be problems. And so after he had heart surgery, he did very poorly. After he left the operating room, he was in a low cardiac output state. He had a stroke as a result of that. He, was, he couldn't come off the ventilator and he had to have a tracheostomy and he was in the ICU for a very, very long time. So adult congenital heart disease specialists and pediatric congenital heart disease specialists already know what the problem is before I've even mentioned that. And that is this. Ross procedure involves the pulmonic valve also. And what you're looking at here is, is his echocardiogram showing the pulmonic valve. And what you're seeing here is what's called flow acceleration as the blood reaches the pulmonic valve. And the flow acceleration occurs because the pulmonic valve is narrowed or what we call stenotic and severely so. And that's why the patient actually had a tricuspid valve problem is because they had a pulmonic valve problem. And that's why the patient was so sick after a heart surgery is because they didn't deal with the pulmonic valve problem as well. So again, taking into account the whole patient and all their congenital heart disease issues that come with their initial repair would have potentially prevented this patient from having the protracted and complicated stay. So let's talk about the Ross procedure so that those of you who have undergone Ross procedure can understand why this is such a challenge. So let's start off with what happens at the beginning. So what you're seeing here is this is the left ventricle and this is a stenotic aortic valve. Of course, it can also be done for a regurgitant aortic valve. And typically that's going to be in a bicuspid aortic valve disease patient, okay? And so 
because oftentimes we don't want to replace the aortic valve in a child with a prosthetic valve, and we want the aortic valve to grow with the child, instead what we do is we do what's called an autograft, which is we take the patient's own valve and we put it into the aortic valve position. So what you're seeing here is actually quite ingenious, which is taking the pulmonic valve here in blue and putting it into the aortic valve position. Now, what you can see here is that the coronary arteries that were originally attached to the patient's aortic root are being re-implanted into the pulmonic valve that's now in the aortic valve position. So that is called the neo-aortic valve now because it's not the pulmonic valve and it's not really the aortic valve either. But now you have to ask the question, well, what are we going to do with the pulmonic valve? Because you've taken it out. So what has to happen then is that the surgeon has to put in an RV to PA conduit. And in this particular situation, it's usually a homograft or that cadaveric pulmonic valve. So a lot of times the people who are critics of the Ross procedure then say, well, gee, you've taken a one valve problem and turned it into a two valve problem because commonly the Ross procedure can be complicated by ultimately that cadaveric homograft valve in the pulmonic position failing over time, but also potentially the, aort the neo-aortic valve failing over time as well in the form of dilation of the neo-aortic root and the an aneurysmal dilation of that neo-aortic root, as well as regurgitation as that area dilates and the leaflets of the neo-aortic valve spreading apart and failing. So those are the critics of it. The people who are proponents of the Ross procedure say, well, that's true, but what's really great is if I have a two-year-old who needs an aortic valve replacement, if I do the Ross procedure, that aortic valve will grow with the child I can put in a pretty decent sized homograft, and it's, there's a good chance that I can get this child to early adulthood, if not mid-adulthood in their 30s with this procedure alone, if the homograft works out in the pulmonic position. So there are pluses and minuses, just like every kind of congenital heart surgery. But the challenge is that if you go to see a cardiologist who doesn't recognize that the Ross procedure involves now two valves, that you're potentially going to run into the problem that our case described. But you would definitely know after we've talked today that the Ross procedure is not a patient that can be left alone and is certainly not a cure. And again, that is why staying in care and having continuous valvular care and assessment is critical. So this is what it looks like now. The good news about Ross procedure is that when the RVDPA homograft fails, we have a solution for it from the transcatheter standpoint. So this is our patient now. Um, I have taken the patient now to the cath lab. And what you're seeing here is an injection in the pulmonary arteries. And you can see that unfortunately, not only is it narrowed right here at the RVDPA homograft, it's also widely regurgitated because the blood flow is just going back and forth. So what we're going to do now is we're going to balloon dilate the valve, the homograft, as you can see here. And then we're going to go ahead and implant a transcatheter pulmonary valve into the RVP conduit. And that's exactly what this is. So what you can see here is we've already implanted a stent into the RVP conduit to dilate it up. And then now we're implanting a Melody transcatheter pulmonary valve into position. And then finally, this is what it looks like now that we've implanted a new competent transcatheter pulmonary valve. So the silver lining to the situation with the Ross procedure is some of these patients may be candidates for transcatheter pulmonary valve with valves such as the Melody valve or the Sapien valve. So he continues to remain in care now, hopefully forever at an adult congenital heart program with surveillance of not only his transcatheter pulmonary valve, but also his aortic valve and root. As you can see here, he's got his prosthetic neo-aortic valve that we're going to be watching for the rest of his life with frequent monitoring. So I would be remiss about not talking about the current COVID pandemic in terms of how you should get your heart care. And I don't want to dwell on this too long other than to show you this recent email from our chief medical officer here at Houston Methodist about where we are in this pandemic. Unfortunately, Omicron has caused a major surge, and we have 
a huge number of COVID patients in our adult hospital. To this day, we are still able to continue to operate and we're still able to take care of patients. So that means that if you have a congenital heart valve problem, you should see your, your physician or healthcare provider in the congenital heart space. That is true not only for our patients, but all of you as well. You should not avoid care because of COVID-19. That said, check with your doctor, but we recommend all of our patients complete their vaccinations irrespective of what that profile might be. And again, that may be dependent on what your doctor recommends. We do recommend that you pay very close attention to the latest word on what the booster vaccination should be for your age group. So obviously for adults now, we are recommending that all of our patients have a booster dose and pay close attention to when their next booster may be required. That is a fact of life with coronavirus. We knew this going into this pandemic that any vaccination was probably not going to last forever, unfortunately, because otherwise we would have been vaccinated against cold viruses too, and that just doesn't happen. If you have signs of COVID, we recommend that you call your ACHD or CHD doctor right away, depending on how severe your illness is and depending on how severe your CHD is. We in particular are very concerned about our single ventricle patients and our Eisenmenger patients. And so we want to hear from those patients. Finally, please continue your congenital heart disease care, irrespective of what's happening with the pandemic. We have ways of getting around it. We have virtual care, we have in-person care, we have ways of dealing with that, especially if you have heart failure symptoms or valvular heart disease symptoms, such as shortness of breath, swelling in the legs, swelling in the belly, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, please do not avoid care just because you're concerned about the pandemic. So let's turn to something that's a little bit more positive. Again, I want to emphasize that this is probably one of the best times to be a congenital heart disease patient because we have amazing innovations that are not only present now, but are coming down the pipeline. So let's start off with transcatheter valve technology. So today in green, there are these approved devices. So there are now approved devices for mitral, aortic, and pulmonic transcatheter valve technology. In the pipeline are a number of different solutions for tricuspid valve pathology as well. So again, I think this is an amazing time to be a patient with congenital valvular heart disease because we have so many different technologies available. And I won't be able to talk about all of them, but I'm gonna to try to touch on a smattering of them so that we can get a fairly reasonable representation. So first of all, let's go back to this whole tetralogy of Fallot and transanal patch of the pulmonic valve. So many of our patients, not only tetralogy of Fallot patients, but some of our other patients too, have undergone this transanal patch augmentation of the pulmonic valve, as well as potentially even pulmonary valvotomy, which is putting a hole in the pulmonary valve or valvectomy, which is cutting out the valve leaflets. And so they are left with severe pulmonic regurgitation in the setting of native right ventricle outflow tract. So we call this native RVOT pulmonic regurgitation. So previously we've had the sapien valve and the melody valve, which have allowed us to implant pulmonic valves in RVTP homographs and bioprosthetic valves. But we haven't had a great solution for these large native RVOT pulmonic regurgitation lesions. But now we have one of the first of these, which is the Medtronic Harmony Valve. And the idea here is that this is a self-expanding stent prosthesis that has a valve inside, sewn inside. And the idea is that when you have a very large right ventricle outflow tract, just like this one here, that this self-expanding stent prosthesis can be inserted here and hug against the walls and conform to the changes of this right ventricular outflow tract throughout the cardiac cycle. Because what happens is this native RVOT, right ventricular outflow tract, throughout the cardiac cycle changes. It contracts, it expands, it moves, et cetera, et cetera, as a normal part of the function of the heart. And so to try to put a fixed stent into this is potentially challenging, if not problematic, especially if the stent is not big enough to stay inside this landing zone. Whereas with this self-expanding stent that can move and change conformation, the idea is that it can expand the size needed for as large as this 
alpha-lipoid tract is. And one of the really cool things that they did during this clinical trial was that they printed many of the hearts um, in 3D printing to see whether or not this valve prosthesis could be implanted successfully. So this was just approved um, last year and has been extremely successful and thrilling in its success. But what's amazing, again, I can't emphasize how amazing this is, is that we have not just one, but a second prosthesis that's approved most recently by the FDA as well. This is just, I believe, recently in the last month, um, also for the same type of anatomy. So this is called the Altera pre-stent. And the idea is similarly, it's a self-expanding stent prosthesis that gets placed into the native RVOT. And again, can expand to the size of that very large um, patchless native RVOT. And then you can implant a sapien valve inside this transcatheter. So what that means then is it was previously the standard of care that all of our tetralogy flow replay, uh, repair patients were going to re require a second open heart surgery to replace that pulmonic valve with a bioprosthetic valve so that in the future we could potentially put in, uh, I'm sorry, and then in the future we could put in a transcatheter pulmonary valve in the form of a melody valve or sapien valve. Now we may be able to avoid that second open heart surgery with either the melody harmony, I'm sorry, the Medtronic harmony or the Edwards Altera pre -stent. So again, amazing news for our tetralogy of flow patients and some of our other patients who have a native RVOT severe pulmonic regurgitation. And again, this is some of the cool research um, that was done to look at the Altera implantation. And again, you can see the use of a, um, a 3D printing, which I think is another one of the amazing advances is 3D printing and the use of it for really testing out some of these novel technologies. So what if you've already had that? bioprosthetic valve, and now you're facing a situation where that prosthetic valve is degenerating. So one of the very cool things that we started seeing is valve and valve technology. So the idea that you can implant a transcatheter valve in a previously implanted surgical valve when it fails. So one of the challenges, of course, and I'll show you a case here, is that we can have too small of a valve implant. So again, sticking with tetralogy for low, because we've talked a lot about it and we've laid the foundation for it, we have a patient here who had her first surgery in, um, in childhood as that initial repair. And then of course she had that surgical valve replacement as her second heart surgery in 2003 with a number 21 paramount. And I will tell you that a number 21 valve is typically going to be small for an adult. And so this is exactly what we're talking about is the idea of outgrowing your surgical uh, prosthetic pulmonary valve. And so now of course she has severe pulmonic stenosis and a failure of her right ventricle as a result for that uh, of that failure of her pulmonic valve. And so typically in the adult space in cardiology, we get very nervous about the failure of the right ventricle. And a lot of these patients get sent for consideration of transplant of their heart because it's typically thought of in the adult space that you just cannot survive with right ventricle dysfunction. Well, of course, the answer to that is it depends. And it depends on whether or not there's something you can fix. And in this particular situation, her problem was failure of the surgical pulmonic valve. So this is the construction of some of the surgical valves. And what you can see here is, is that there is a stent made out of metal. There is additional metal pieces that form the stent. And then of course, there's a sewing ring that's put around it so the surgeon can sew it into the, um, into the heart. And then of course, here are the prosthetic leaflets that are constructed here out of bovine pericardium, which is cow heart sac material into a competent valve. The challenge with this, of course, is now you have a metal ring um, in here. And one of the problems is, of course, as I told you, number 21 is going to be small to begin with. Typically, what we like to see between 24 to 27 um, in terms of the size. Um, and the problem is if I put a, uh, a transcatheter valve or stent in this, it's going to narrow it further such that the orifice turns into 17 millimeters. So we wanna be very careful and judicious about how we use a transcatheter valve in this type of situation, because we could potentially create a situation where the patient is going to have what we call patient prosthesis mismatch, where the patient and their heart demands and function are too much for the size of the ring in which the valve is placed. So we wanna be very careful about that. But what we found now, and again, this is an innovation that, um, that one of my colleagues in the space 
of congenital heart and valve valvular heart disease was able to identify is that you can actually break this ring. So if we put a high pressure uh, balloon in it, what you can see here is initially it's about 18 millimeters internal diameter of the valve ring. And then what we did was we actually fractured that valve ring and we were able to get to about 20, 21 millimeters of size. And then from there, we were actually able to implant. And here you're actually seeing a sapien valve being implanted into that space. And we were able to get about a 21 millimeter valve into that. So it's a, nominally it's a 23 millimeter sapien valve that we're putting in there, but we were able to get a true space of about 21 millimeters. So we were able to get a little bit of time for this patient. So what you can see here is now her, her heart is functioning really well. It's really contracting nicely. And we got the pressure inside her heart to a very manageable level. And she was actually discharged the very next day and was taken off the transplant list because she had a marked improvement in her right ventricular size and function. So what that means then is that there is hope for our surgical valve replacement patients that we can do valve and valve, so transcather valve in surgical valve replacement, even if the valve ring is a little too small, because we can actually break the valve ring and get that transcatheter valve in. It's not for every patient, but for some of our patients, we can get away without another surgery, at least for this interim period. Now, how long is that transcatheter valve going to last? Well, the jury is still a little bit out because we haven't had transcatheter valve technology for that long, but we're hoping that we can get away with at least the same that we get from surgical bioprosthesis, which is about 10 to 15 years. And if we can defer surgical valve replacement for at least 10 to 15 years, and potentially even put in another transcatheter valve in that ring, potentially we can put a put off surgery for about 20, potentially even 30 years if we can get away with two transcatheter valve replacements. So I think, again, this is a great time to be a, a, a patient with congenital heart valve or heart disease because we now have potentially mitral valve solutions and soon we may even have tricuspid valve solutions. So I'm gonna show you this technology here, which is edge-to-edge -edge repair. And the idea is that if you have a leaking mitral valve here, which is what you're seeing, potentially you can treat that leaking mitral valve with a clip that's gonna to bring together the edges of the valve and stop the highest area of leak from leaking. And you can see here what it does is it does create two different orifices as opposed to one singular orifice, but potentially it can reduce the amount of regurgitation once you've placed that clip. So this is what we call mitral clip, but in fact, there's actually, this is courtesy of my partner, Dr. Sachin Gohl. Um, this is one of his cases where he's placing it in the tricuspid position under a clinical trial context. And what you can see here is oftentimes it requires more than one clip to treat the tricuspid valve. And of course, this is under research um, right now, but I think it's very exciting because potentially eventually we're gonna have a solution for this. And this is what he gets. So this is the initial torrential um, tricuspid regurgitation you can see here. And this is after he placed those two clips. And I think you can see very clearly that it's reduced. It's not perfect, but it's definitely reduced. And of course, there are many different technologies that are also being studied right now as well. So finally, I wanna to touch on the hybrid approach. So this is what we showed you for hybrid approach, which is the idea that you can do an open chest, but avoid cardiopulmonary bypass and the attending problems that come with that and create a landing zone for a transcanner valve implant, which is, I would say probably at this point in time, old hat. But what's very cool now is that the Boston group has now created a potential solution, which is, implanting this surgically two, valve, two leaflet valve solution in a child, and then going in and balloon dilating it as the patient grows to adult size, potentially minimizing the requirement for additional open heart surgeries until a patient reaches adulthood. Again, with the goal of getting the patient to adulthood without additional open heart valve replacements. And this is for those patients who just can't get away without requiring a valve replacement in childhood. So I believe this is very exciting. I think this is, I, um, I think it's a little early yet to know exactly where this is going for our, all of our patients, but I think it's very exciting technology that's coming out. And I think it's something that we should all stay tuned to. So let's talk about the future. So this is one of the holy grails now that I think many different centers are looking at. This is specifically the University of Minnesota's technology where they are creating from patients' own cells a valve, um, uh, ex vivo. 
And then you can actually potentially use that valvular tissue that's made out of live cells and implant it into the patient. So very exciting technology, not quite ready for prime time, but extremely exciting, and potentially really, really game changing. And of course, this is the other one that I think everybody really wants to see win, but is still a real challenge. And that is the idea that maybe you can treat these patients before they're even born. So that way you can actually allow some of these patients to grow up with two ventricles as opposed to single ventricle physiology. So it is a challenge. I think we still don't know where to use it and how to use it successfully. I think it's still not quite ready for prime time for a lot of our patients and the results are still mixed for long-term solutions, but I think it's a very exciting technology and I think it's something to stay tuned for. So in summary, I hope that you'll come away with the idea that in patients such as our patients with Ross procedure and tetralogy flow, staying in care is vitally important and repaired is not cured. So continue to have regular care with congenital heart disease physician, both in the pediatric space as well as the adult space is critical to well-being. That safely getting care for congenital valvular heart disease at um, places that have comprehensive care for congenital heart disease is really critical, especially when you have to take into account all of the congenital heart lesions that the patient has. And I think that stays the case irrespective of where things stand with the COVID pandemic. I think we need to continue taking care of our patients in the COVID pandemic. And then finally, um, there are truly amazing innovations that are happening in valvular heart care, not the least of which is this Harmony um, self-expanding pulmonic valve prosthesis. I think this is an extremely exciting time to be a patient with congenital heart valvular heart disease. And I think there are so many amazing technologies that are coming down the pipeline. So I was only able to touch on prosthetic valve uh, um, replacements briefly. Um, if you want to learn more about this, Dr. McGillivray has created our chief of cardiac surgery here, has created this amazing video where he goes into the details of bioprosthetic and mechanical prostheses that we featured at our adult congenital heart symposium back in 2020. This is a QR code that will take you to specifically this part of the congenital heart symposium um, where we talk about these, um, these prostheses and how they work and how they're implanted into the patient's heart. And with that, I'll stop and, and we should take some questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Lin. That was, I could have sat here and honestly listened to that all day. That was so fascinating. And um, I, you know, as long as I've been in this kind of CHD world, I did not, um, did not really understand the initial repair for tetralogy of flow until you went through it today. So, and Andrea said the same thing. We were texting each other back and forth that this is just fascinating. But since you, um, I'm going to start with the second question, since you just talked about um, using the patient's own cells to grow a valve, um, the, um, someone is asking, would it, is it, is that less possible with a child with congenital valve disease, like does it, if you have congenital valve disease, does it affect the DNA like um, to create, to grow valves? Yeah, so, so I need to make sure that we communicate that this is still science fiction and not science fact. Okay? Right. So we can grow those valves in, um, in a chamber. And so far what most of it this is, is so far as doing it in animal studies, I think the challenge that we will probably see even before we get to talking about the genetic material is we're gonna be talking about durability challenges, okay? Because the challenge is when you take a bunch of cells that are say stem cells and you grow them into, a, into say a scaffold, which is typically what we're talking about. So what most of these projects are doing is they're taking say that homograft, right? That we've already talked about um, multiple times today. And they're removing the cells, they're treating it so that we remove all the cellular material inside it and creating a scaffold that you can put the cells into. So then you put it into a chamber, like a beaker, like a sterile beaker with growth medium in it. And then you put a bunch of the patient's cells to circulate around the growth medium. And then those cells will get into the scaffold that's made out of the homograft and start to grow within that scaffold. So the problem that I foresee in that is the scaffold itself is still not living. You now have cells in it, but are those cells really going to recapitulate the material that they normally do when they grow normally in a, in a embryo, 
and I don't know that, and I don't know that they will, we can probably influence and engineer that over time as we've gotten better and better at it. But right now, I think success is defined as just getting cells to grow into that scaffold and then getting that scaffold to be able to be implanted into say an animal model and work. So I think that's where we are right now in the technology. I don't think we're at the point where we can actually say, put into a human being yet, number one, and number two, know whether or not that's going to be successful in a human being yet. And number three, getting to the question, yes, I think those are very important questions, whether or not the genetic material of the patient is going to preclude successful development of valve. I think the answer is probably going to be yes, because I think ultimately the development of a functioning valve is not going to require the same processes as embryologically development of that congenital heart lesion but we have a long while to go. So I would suspect that we're at least probably another decade out before we're gonna have first than man implants in the United States. It will probably happen in other countries as first than man successfully and successful demonstration of proof of concept, say, you know, five year, seven year, 10 year success. Um, and I think, you know, the way we do things in the United States, I think it's gonna require seeing that somewhere else before we start doing it in human beings in the US. So I think it's gonna be a little while before we get to answering that question is the long answer to that question. Well, thank you. That, um, yeah, it is, uh, it is science fiction, but hopefully, you know, we'll continue to figure it out and uh, figure out how that can be implanted and grow with the patient. Um, you have another question about TGA um, transposition of the great arteries. And the question is, um, have you ever replaced a pulmonary valve via cath on a patient with arterial switch and right ventri ventricular outflow tract reconstruction with a cow's patch for stenosis? Has yeah, that's stenosis a great question. I, I don't see theoretically why it shouldn't be doable. So we have not done that here. Um, and in part, that's because here in Texas, we were a little bit sort of slower in adopting the arterial switch procedure in this region. Um, so we have a lot more atrial switch um, patients still. Um, so we have not seen that many arterial switches that have failed. So, so we, still have, um, we still have a little bit of time before that's gonna happen. But I think from a theoretical standpoint, I'm not sure that there's a reason that it shouldn't be doable. Um, I think, you know, obviously I would check with your congenital heart center and ask specifically to meet with the interventional cardiologist at your congenital heart center to ask them that question. Um, there are probably going to be very specific issues there that are going to be important to discuss. And that is probably going to be the way the anatomy um, overlays. I think anticipated issues are, of course, that the coronary arteries can potentially be impacted by that. And so I think that those are all going to be very important questions to ask. So, so number one, make sure you ask to meet with the interventional cardiologist at your congenital heart center. Number two, ask a lot about how your anatomy can potentially impact that transcatheter valve implantation, especially the coronary arteries. Great, yeah, I think they they have a child who is, who is needs this and has been approved for sa um, Harmony, Sapien, or Altera. So, um, and they did say they're concerned about the coronary arteries being too close and the pulmonary valve being so close. So, you know, they just didn't know if it had ever been successfully done before um, in, for that specific thing. Um, someone also has asked whether or not with that, the cone procedure, again, I know that's something in the future, the science fiction piece of it, but will that or any other thing, I guess, um, any other repair grow with the child? Um, I'm sorry, let me make sure I'm understanding. This is the cone procedure? The cone you showed, I think it's that cone you showed last with the, the, the future. I think that's what they're talking about. No, it's not. Okay, hold on. Just... So the cone procedure, I think we're talking about Epstein. Yes, Epstein's. Yeah, so that's a really, <laughs> that's a really challenging question. So the first thing I wanna say is this, the cone procedure is very hard, okay? Um, and I think um, as a non-surgeon and as a consumer of cardiac surgery, as a referring physician, I think it's very important that you make sure that you um, know who's doing the cone surgery and that they have a good track record of doing it. 
well. Because I think first and foremost, before we talk about longevity of the cone and growing with the child, I think knowing that the person who's doing the cone surgery has had a lot of experience. Um, I, I think um, the challenge is I think that um, it's a hard surgery. Um, and it takes a lot of experience to do. So, so that would be the first, the first, um, first part of it. And let me just see. Um, so in theory, it should, um, because you are typically using the patient's own valve. So you're trying to make the patient's own valve competent again um, with the cone procedure. Um, so, but again, I think it's all in the surgeon's hands, right? So I think growing with the child, yes, in theory, but the challenge that I would be concerned about is the durability of the repair because of the hands of the surgeon. So again, I think, you know, without sort of pointing out people and naming names, I think there are certain people um, uh, in the United States who have a lot more experience with cone surgery. And I think your um, congenital heart uh, uh, specialist can probably point you in the right direction from that standpoint um, without sort of, um, uh, taking sides. Um, I think it's very important that you make sure you ask that question specifically, because I think the durability from that standpoint is more specifically about how well that surgery is done. Okay. Less than whether or not it grows with the child. It will grow with the child, but it depends on whether or not it's done the right way. Well, thank you for understanding the question a lot better than I did and answering it. Um, we have one final question and then we will, we don't have time for any more, but um, are there any new innovations to address a subaortic membrane that is causing subaortic stenosis in a bicuspid aortic valve? Yeah, so that's a challenge. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to break out subaortic stenosis into two categories. Okay. So, so the first one is subaortic membrane. Um, and I think sometimes people mix up subaortic membrane with subaortic stenosis. So subaortic membrane, probably not. There has been some data that suggests that it may respond to ballooning. And now I'm going to tell you that most people will say that's crazy and don't do it. Okay. But if you want to ask about what's really at the edge of, um, of what you can achieve, yes, that has been described and there has been some success. I don't think it's standard of care. So please don't see that as a recommendation, okay? So typically the standard of care is still surgical resection if necessary, okay? So let's talk about, and again, we're gonna talk about things that are on the edge, okay? Not standard of care. Let's talk about subaortic uh, obstruction. So for our patients who are absolutely not, 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 not surgical candidates, we have seen some very interesting data that suggests that the mitral valve can participate in that subaortic obstruction. So if you can stop the mitral valve from impacting the subaortic obstruction in the setting of certain types of sub, um, mitral valve pathology, in addition to the subaortic obstruction, that a mitral clip can actually reduce that obstruction. Now, again, that is way not standard of care. Okay, so please do not go to your congenital heart specialist and say, oh, Dr. Lin told you that mitral clip and, and ballooning can solve subaortic uh, obstruction. These are in the situations where we have to really think out of the box for patients who are quote unquote impossible and have no options, okay? Um, and cannot go through the standard of care. We're talking very much at the edge of appropriate um, for what they should, should get for care. Those are situations where we have no other options and the patient's looking for some sort of palliation that that has been uh, an option. So, but I would say at the end of the day, the typical standard of care is going to be surgery and we don't have a great FDA approved solution yet from a transcatheter standpoint. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Lin. This has honestly been so fascinating and um, we will have the recording available for people uh, to watch probably, is, probably by tomorrow and we'll send out the link. Um, we also would like to, again, thank Medtronic for helping us bring this to you and supporting our educational programming on uh, congenital valve disease. Thank you again so much, and uh, we hope you all have a wonderful day, and thank you for attending our webinar. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bye, everybody. Bye.